Welcome to the Robot Podcast. I'm Fran Scott, maker, demonstration developer, and massive engineering fan. Every week, my guests and I will be exploring the exciting stories of how robots can, will, and are impacting our everyday life. From sorting food to cleaning our hospitals, from manufacturing cars to creating sustainable buildings, robots are pushing the boundaries to meet the demands and challenges of a changing world. And as technology improves, it is becoming easier for robots to adapt and perform multiple tasks that, behind the scenes, offer huge societal benefits. It's all about flexibility and simplicity. This time, it's all about robots and humans working together. We're talking cobots. And to help us talk about cobots, we are joined by Andy Jung, Global Products Manager for Collaborative Robots at ABB. Hello, it's nice to be here. And Dr. Ayana Howard, roboticist at the Georgia Institute of Technology and best-selling author of Sex, Race and Robots. Hi. Later on, we'll also be speaking to Akosh Demota from Glaub Automation, who are using cobots in their production line. To start with, though, I have a question for you two. If you had a robot sidekick, what would you use it for? All right. Well, every Christmas, I have a lot of presents to wrap and a lot of Christmas cards to write. Now, I would really appreciate if I had a cobot, a cobot sidekick that can help me wrap the presents, uh, tie the ribbons, and maybe write the envelopes of the Christmas cards for me. <laughs> nice. And you, Ayana? Um, so my robot sidekick would be my my memory aid. Um, I'm really bad at remembering people's names, especially if I'm supposed to talk to them later. So my robot sidekick would be like, oh, that's the person that you met 10 years ago, and this is their portfolio, here's their resume, and this is what you have to say. Ugh, that would be heaven. And um, For me as well, I um, anyone that knows me knows this quite well, is that I absolutely hate cleaning but like the boring cleaning so not necessarily vacuuming that's exciting cleaning like the dusting and I have like little ornaments and books so if I could have a collaborative robot that would um, just dust for me without destroying all my belongings that would be a winner and the thing is that might not be happening soon but this question isn't as far-fetched as we might think robot sidekicks are already here maybe not ones that can dust your books but they are helping us out everywhere from factories to airports and they're called cobots and in this episode we'll be finding out how cobots can best help us out whether we should worry about if they will take our jobs and the implications for society if we have robots working with us so closely so ayana what is a cobot um, and so I'm, I'm going to define this the way that uh, an academic would. So first off, as, as roboticists, we love acronyms like COBOT. What is that? Collaborative Robotics. What is that? Human Robot Interaction, which is HRI. So um, when I think about collaborative robotics or COBOTs, I really do think about um, robots that are interacting directly with humans, either in the same space or in a, you know, the same intellectual space. Um, but they really are assisting and augmenting our capabilities as people. And Andy, what kind of thing, if we were to draw a cobot, what kind of thing would we be drawing? All right, let me give you some visual aid here. So throw away your pre-existing notion of how an industrial robot looks like. Imagine a beautiful piece of industrial design, a slim arm, slimmer than a human arm. It sits on a small base, smaller than an A4 paper. It's very lightweight. For example, one of our robots weighs less than 10 kilos, so you can easily pick it up and move it around. It has soft padding, rounded edges, and a friendly appearance so that you want to put your hand on it and touch it. And you can move the robot with your hand and program it with a touchscreen tablet. That's what we're talking about here. And does this exist already? Yes, it does. At ABB, we have a full portfolio of collaborative robots. And the one with soft padding, two arms, looks almost humanoid, is called the Yumi robot. So Yumi stands for you and me. So we really wanted to emphasize that this is for human and robot to work together. Collaboratively, some might say. Exactly. <laughs> so, Andy, how does a cobot actually work? It's working with the human, but... 
but how? Yes, exactly. So the difference between collaborative robots and industrial robots is that they have additional safety functions. They have unique design, which will not hurt people, such as rounded edges, no pinch points. And we really focus on the ease of use because we want more people to be able to use collaborative robots to automate tasks in their factories. Well, and outside factories. So in terms of working with the humans, they need to be able to see, hear and understand the instructions, but also be safe to be around humans. So how do we make sure they're safe, Ayana? We really have to model the interaction with the individual. So if you're thinking about a, a task, right? So especially if you're on you know, the, the factory floor, even in the home environment, you kind of know how to wash dishes, right? You can think about what does that look like? What are the functional behaviors? Um, and then have the robot, as the human is doing, whatever task it is, actually put the human as, as an element in their planning, as an element in their interaction. So that, and, and I truly believe that the robot is the one that should defer to the human. The human is the one that's in command and the robot adapts itself to the human. And I think that's really how it is about safety versus the human having to kind of watch themselves around the robot. So what are the benefits of cobots? What can they do that us humans aren't that good at? Aren't that good at or and also that we don't want to do, right? So, for example, mundane, repetitive tasks, like I mentioned with wrapping Christmas presents, maybe some people enjoy it. But if you have to write 100 cards then and you end up signing your name, writing the same thing 100 times, it gets a little less boring. So typically humans prefer to do the more creative tasks. So something that's very suitable for cobots to do are the repetitive tasks. And also what they can do is help us with different tasks that's around us, for example, baking bread, for example, assembling small electrical components, for example, testing the screen on your cell phone, et cetera. So uh, there's a wide range of tasks that humans either are not good at doing or do not want to do and are better left to collapse to robots. So Ayana, now here in 2021, what are collaborative robots being used for? So there's a wide variety of tasks that, that collaborative robotics are being used for. Um, so one, of course, is, is healthcare in, in the hospital environments and, and things like that. Uh, the other um, is in places where you want to have increased safety. So in the grocery store, in the, in the quote unquote retail stores that still exist. Hold the phone. You're saying that we're using cobots in retail stores? Yes, yes. Um, in, for example, hardware stores, we're using them in grocery stores. Some of it is to do a straightforward things such as um, cleaning with people in the same space. Some of it is even trying to do manipulation and grabbing um, items that are on the shelves. Um, and so this is, this is interesting. It's an interesting time that we're in. Is it only in a few shops or is it most large supermarkets? Um, so these are more larger shops. So, for example, in the United States, some of the hardware stores, I believe it was Lowe's, uh, was the last one that I saw, um, had uh, an example of, of a cobot that was um, helping customers um, in terms of, and, and most of these businesses are large, large chains. Um, they're not the small, you know, mom and pop shops, not quite yet. That's where we want to bring them. So these cobots, they're in healthcare, which we're going to talk about a lot in another episode. They're in retail. Anywhere else? Well, ABB originally designed you, me, and our cobots to sit on electronics assembly lines next to human workers who are, you know, assembling electronic components. But since we launched them, many other industries are also in interested. So this include testing of for example, an ATM machine, we actually have that as a real use case in Switzerland, where a company that is developing software for ATM, so they developed, the engineers developed the software during the day, and overnight, Yumi is testing the software by, you know, putting in the ATM card into the machine, pressing the buttons, pressing the right, pressing the wrong, multiple times overnight. So the next morning, when the engineers come back to work, they have the test results, and they can do fine-tuning adjustment of the software. Now, Andy, you very much have the inside scoop on the latest ABB cobots. 
What have you been up to the past few years? Because I know you've been quite busy. Yes, we have just launched our new portfolio of collaborative robots. So we started with Yumi, which is for low payload applications, so smart handling. And now we're launching the GoFa, which stands for you can go farther with this robot. <laughs> GoFa is your all-around cobot helper. It's like a Swiss army knife. So you can use it to do any task. It can handle a higher payload up to five kilos. It has a longer arm reach. So you are able to pick up objects from farther away and place them. And we really want to make this robot more like a, I would say like a household appliance you might buy, like a gadget you might buy, right? It arrives in a nice cardboard box, you unbox it, mount it. We have a tutorial that you can scan using a QR code. And within, I would say half an hour, you can be working on your robot, teaching it what to do using touchscreen, uh, drag and drop tablet interface. So we really feel that with this robot, um, first time users, people who never tried robots before will be able to succeed. So Gopher is basically designed to have a higher payload. So basically it can lift more than Yumi can. And also it's just a general use so it can help you go far. I do. I do love that pun. And you've got another one as well on the way, haven't you, that you've launched? Yes, we have another portfolio because we know that sometimes for some of our customers, cycle time and speed is important. So the robot needs to be fast. And that's why we have Swifty, which of course means super fast. In a collaborative application, sometimes it's a robot and a human working closely together. But sometimes the robot is actually doing its own tasks most of the time on its own. And the human may be only checking on the robot once in a while. So in these cases, it's beneficial for the robot to work as fast as possible when there is no human near and it's safe to do so. So that's why we have Swifty, which is based on our industrial robot design. So very high speed, very high precision, but with the help of additional sensors, it can detect when a human gets close and that's when it will slow down to a safe speed and also stop so that there is no dangerous collision between a human coworker and Swifty. That's brilliant. I can just imagine a bit like on Toy Story. So when we shut the doors and the robots are there working away, then as soon as we open the doors, they slow down and like they're like, oh, humans are about. We need to just sort of slow down to human speed to make sure that we're safe. Exactly. Let's go on to an example of these cobots in action. I am joined by Akosh Demota from Glaub Automation, who have been using ABB's Yumi Cobots in their factories. Hello, Akosh. Yeah, thank you very much for having me here. Absolute pleasure. First question, what do Glaub do? All right, so we are a system integrator company from Germany. We mostly work with automotive and electronic clients. So automotives, electronics, electronics that go in cars. Correct, correct, yes. Yeah, also, you know, all sorts of multimedia equipment. It could be also for uh, control equipment for the cars. Okay, and tell me about how you use Cobots. We work with placing electronic components on a printed circuit board. If you haven't heard of printed circuit board before, that's, this is this green or sometimes blue board that is inside every electronic gadget that you have you usually have hundreds or sometimes thousands of components, very, very small components sitting on them, like uh, chips, for example, microprocessors, things like this. You need to make sure that the components are very firmly on the board and they don't break off. So in this case, you want to use a technology called through hole. That is because the, the component itself is not on the top of the, of the board, but it has this leads they are like the legs or pins if you like these are going through the board and then they're soldered from beneath so what's happening is that when you put these pins through <laughs> through the hole when you are slightly tilting the part for example or so there might be small damages on them which might not cause any issue during the production process but you never know, maybe they will fall off after 100,000 kilometers driven on the car. And you don't want that to happen to any, any safety-related part in the car. And we are talking about very small parts here. So you should imagine something roughly half a millimeter or so in diameter. So really, really small pins. 
that process is usually done manually at the moment. And this is what we have been working on. And this is a, this is a project that we have recently delivered with an ABB, ABB UMI robot. That's amazing. I know exactly what you're on about because, yeah, getting those legs, getting the pins through the hole of the PCB, the printed circuit board, is not easy without touching anything around it. So what you're saying is you have used cobots to be able to do that, to put those components in and get those pins and legs through those holes Mm -hmm. in a way that means they're not damaged and they're not touching anything else of the PCB. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why did you pick ABB's UB cobots for this job? The two main reasons why we chose them is really because of the precision that the robot could offer and also um, that it has two arms. So by using two arms, we could be twice as fast as, uh, as, with a, as with a conventional robot. Of course, the fact that this is also a collaborative robot made it easier for us to integrate into the production line. You should imagine a regular production line where there are people walking around and there are operators sitting by and something like that. So, so therefore, having a collaborative robot that could stop if it's hit was, was very nice to have also. Um, and what advantages do these cobots have? Um, I was going to say, compared to their colleagues, they're, say there's a human in one cell mm-hmm. working on a, a piece, and then there's a cobot in another cell working on a different part of the production line. What advantages and disadvantages do the cobots have over the human? Having a robot that has much better hand-eye coordination, this gives us the possibility of having much better quality at the end. So this was the, So quality in this time was a primary reason for automating. Besides that, we are also here we are also talking about an operation which is running uh, uh, in three shifts. So when you can get the robot running through the launch breaks and therefore it can produce more, this will get you a much higher output for the whole line, maybe even for the whole factory. When we actually calculated this, how much this would mean, we we calculated that this would in like in this case it, this meant a fourteen percent increase on total output. Well, thank you very much, Akosh. Um, this has been enlightening. Thank you. Thank you also. And that was Akosh Demota there from Glaub Automation. So going forwards. Andy, you again, what are the technical challenges that lie ahead before this basically becomes mainstream? I would say one is how to teach the robot, right? We are making robots easier and easier to use, you know, drag and drop, et cetera, like I mentioned before. But for many people new to robots, their ultimate goal is to be able to teach a robot by demonstration, like you teach a human apprentice. So... I would say this is one of the challenges, how we can make teaching a robot more natural, like teaching a human. And the second is really trust. And I think in the future, we will definitely have more robots in our lives, all kinds of robots. And we are slowly starting to accept them. For example, Siri and Alexa, this is a great example. We have all accepted these robots into our lives. And I think that we will accept more collaborative robots into our factories, into retail, et cetera, around us. And Ayana, have you got anything to add to that? Um, So I think one is acceptance. I think the other is trust um, that these robots will perform when they are supposed to in in a safe and effective and unbiased way is that aspect. And then the other is actually over reliance. We also need to make sure that humans stay human. Uh, And so balancing, you know, what does that look like in the future? We don't have to really think about it now, but, you know, as these robots become more capable, you know, at some point we do have to think about, you know, our tendency to maybe be over-reliant on these robots um, in that aspect. And Ayana, talk to me a bit more about us trusting these robots to do what we want them to do, because I know you've done a lot of work on this. Yeah, so we have a habit of over-trusting robots when they start working well, uh, which also means that we don't second-guess them when they don't. Because we, you know, we know even if robots are accurate at 99.99999%, you know, there's, there's that one time that they don't work. Um, and, you know, if it's just a, you know, oh, so I dropped a part, that's one thing. But if it's something that could cause harm, that's another. 
Um, and so trying to think about how do you have robots maybe tell their humans, you know, at what point, you know, oh, we're at the point zero, 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 one, that this might not work. You know, I just want to let you know uh, to be aware uh, that I might do something wrong. And talk to me a bit about um, the first impressions, because I know that you've done a bit of work on this. Yeah. So uh, we had looked at what are people's propensity to follow the guidance of a robot, of a cobot, um, if they either had a working robot or a robot that made a mistake? And, and what does their trust profile look like? Um, and so just for a, a lot of individuals, a lot of companies, that first impression is really important. When you open up the box and bring out your cobot, it better work. And it better work very well, like, i.e., I press one, two, three, and it works as, like it's supposed to. That is more important than it being, you know, wang, bang, like all things to all people. Um, it's that first impression influences their interaction with it throughout their entire interactions later on. What do you think, Andy? To Ayana's point, I think, uh, so first of all, regarding first impressions, I really reflected on this because when we first launched Yumi at Hanover Fair in 2015, I have this super strong visual there was this little girl, she couldn't have been more than eight years old. And she just walked up to the Yumi robot and put her hands on it and started moving its arm. So, you know, nobody needed to explain to the girl that this is a safe robot, you can touch it. The design speaks for itself. So I think that's where we had a great first impression. And the industrial design of the Yumi robot had a large part to play there. That's a really good point. But surely there are societal implications of us having these robots at our beck and call, especially, let's say, if we put a human face on it or like as we have with some domestic robots at the moment, they have a female voice to them. What are your thoughts on that, Ayana? Yeah, so one of the things is that our interactions with robots is starting to influence our interactions with other humans. Um, and so that is a danger. So when we, I, I don't think we should gender our robots, especially if they're helper robots, right? Because there's going to be an assumption then if our helper robot is gendered as female, that we then perpetuate that stereotype that, you know, females are here to help us. And, and we see that. We, we definitely see that. And so these cobots should not have a gender, they should not have a race, they should not have an age, they should have a, not have a nationality, because that would influence our human-human interactions, which is a really bad thing. Hang on, when you say we see that, have we seen that with the robots that are cobots that are in our lives now? Yes, we do. Um, so we've done some studies, and not just in my own research group, but in others, where if you have an individual who is allowed to you know, yell at their, their robot, uh, what we see is that they start changing their voice pattern to their human colleagues, right? Um, and even if you have just a, a slight, you know, these are fairly short-term studies, um, and you're just looking at a little bit of change in vocalization and things like that, it's, it's happening. Andy, I now come to you with the rather large question. So say that we've got robots in our retail shops, we've got them in our factories, are these robots, these cobots, going to take human jobs? Like we said from the beginning, these are collaborative robots, right? Their task is to collaborate with humans, not to kick us out. So no, they are not going to steal our jobs. What they should do is do the boring stuff, the mundane, the repetitive tasks, which frees us up for more creative and more interesting things. And I think we talk about this quite a lot. And I think the evidence is very clear. So I talk to manufacturers, customers, people from different industries, whether it's ice cream shop owners or, you know, retail shop owners or factory owners, both in Asia. I worked in China for almost 10 years before relocating to Munich and in Europe and in the U.S., you know, everywhere I talk to people, there is a lack of qualified labor. So companies, as they grow, they cannot hire more people because it's just a lack of people. And even in low-cost countries like China, the young people, they don't want to work in factories. They want to be artists. They want to be, what do you call, baristas, right? Mixologists, etc. So everywhere, there is a lack of people who are willing to do these boring, dull, mundane, repetitive tasks. So Collaborative robots will help organizations, retail shops, mom and pop shops to be more productive and more profitable. 
in bringing automation to people who were not able to use automation before. That makes sense. There's part of my jobs that is so repetitive that I'm just like, actually, if I could siphon off that part of the job, then I could do the things that only a human could do. And actually, my output just as a single human would be more productive. So I can't imagine in terms of scaling this up to a factory, to an industry, to a sector, the difference it could make. Yeah. Imagine if every day we could just do the things we thought were fun. Oh, please, please. (laughs) Get a robot. (laughs) In all seriousness, though, where do you think this could really make a difference? Where do you two think that cobots can really change the world? So from my perspective, our ambition is to bring collaborative robot automation to more users, to really allow small and medium-sized companies retail shops, hospitals, labs, places that did not think they could use robots before enable them to benefit from robot automation, to increase their productivity, to help them with their labor shortage, and to improve their business. This is how I think collapsed robots will change the world. And you, Ayana? Yeah. um, So I'm going to, I have a bias because I work in both the healthcare and education space. So my personal dream is that uh, these collaborative robotics really influence and and change for good this whole aspect of healthcare, which of course includes things like hospitals and clinics and nursing homes, for example, as well as education, which is, you know, in the classroom, um, in workforce development, in retraining and upskilling humans for, for other jobs. Um, So those are the two that I really um, am excited about. And unfortunately, that is all we've got time for. But a massive thank you to our panel, Andy Zhang from ABB and Dr. Yana Howard from the Georgia Institute of Tech. And of course, Akosh Demota from Glaub Automation. Next time, we'll be diving much deeper into healthcare, where cobots and robots are revolutionizing hospitals and helping to save lives please drop us a review on Apple Podcasts and don't forget to subscribe to the Robot Podcast so you never miss an episode. I'm Fran Scott and this has been a Fresh Air production for ABB. Part of the ABB Decoded series. 